Good day and welcome to the first session of Cardiac Imaging Agora. In this session, we are going to learn together how to do a step-by-step -step reading of a PET scan. So we start usually with these steps. This is a straightforward process that we go through every time we look at a PET scan or in general at a myocardial perfusion imaging. So the first step is to review the transmission imaging and the emission images, adjust the reconstruction planes, review rest and stress construction or reconstructed images, score the polar maps, review the rest and stress gated images with all what comes with them, review the blood flow, review the CT images, and finally, more importantly, uh, generate a meaningful report. So let's first start with the transmission and emission images. As you will know with PET scanning or with uh, SPEC scanning with CT attenuation correction, we have a, a set of CTs and a set of perfusion images superimposed on each other. So we will have to make sure that the contours of these images, as you can see right here, are all properly aligned. So the CT contours of the heart and the perfusion contours of the heart are properly aligned. And in this example here, they look uh, fine and aligned. You can always move them to align them properly to make sure that you have uh, good uh, data co-registration. Then we go to the uh, uh, reconstructed images. And again, here you can see that the uh, correctly in the rest images on the bottom, the machine uh, detected the borders of the myocardium and uh, put the uh, markers there. Whereas on the stress images right here in the middle, the machine is pointing to somewhere in the GI system uh, to reconstruct the heart, which is obviously is not correct. After we, uh, the, we redirect the machine to figure out where the heart is, we center this around the, uh, the heart. We uh, choose, uh, we pick our margins, as you can see right here, and then we uh, process these images as such, uh, which will result in the uh, uh, general uh, normal a uniform display of myocardial perfusion images with the stress images on top on the bottom images uh, representing the uh, rest images. And you can see here starting with the short axis from the apex to the base of the heart. Uh, you can see a uniform normal perfusion of the heart uh, uh, all in the interior segment, uh, septal segments, inferior segments, and lateral segments. And again you see the same display showing normal perfusion of the heart in the horizontal long axis images, as well as the vertical long axis images without any defects. And what you can see here very clearly right away is that the uh, heart is, uh, at least in the short axis, I always say if the donut uh, is complete or the bagel is complete, that means they, uh, there are no perfusion defects and there is no difference between the rest and stress images, indicating no presence of ischemia or infarcts. The next step is to score uh, the polar maps. This is the uniform uh, standard, the scoring of myocardial perfusion imaging. It's been uh, uh, widely available since the early 2000s. Uh, that's how we score them uniformly, so we can all speak the same language. So we score them on a 17 segment model. Uh, very easily, this uh, area here represents the septum. Uh, on top here, we represent the anterior wall, uh, the inferior wall, and the lateral wall, all over 17 segments. And you can see here, again, uh, we can use this uh, scale of scoring, zero being normal, four being no perfusion, and in both the rest and stress images here, not a surprise, uh, the system scored it as zero, meaning normal, and we agree with this and we move on from here to score this as a some stress and some different score of zero, indicating absence of uh, scar or ischemia. One other thing we look at before we move on to look at the gated images is look at the histogram to make sure that we capture the uh, images for the gated images all within a, a, some reasonable heart rate without extra ectopy. Uh, this is a difficult problem to deal with after the fact, especially with PET because of the short half-life of rubidium. So you wanna make sure that this is uh, correctly acquired at a, a stable heart rate uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see this is uh, on the rest images uh, where the heart rate was almost 70 uh, with a very narrow tight uh, uh, histogram. And similarly here, post-stress, the heart rate went up as expected with ragadenosin uh, to about 80, 85, 
again with a very uh, narrow uh, histogram. The next images we look at are the gated images uh, with rest, with spec and with uh, PET, at least at our center, we look at both the rest images that we gate and the stress images. So we look at uh, the motion, the wall motion, uh, the uh, uh, basically representing uh, thickening, the brightness representing thickening of the heart during systole. We look at segmental wall motion and magnets of present. And in this example, of course, this is a normal heart, so we don't expect to see that. And then we look at the ejection fraction and the rest and stress images seen here uh, uh, showing an ejection fraction, 62% uh, at rest going up to 71% post-stress with the volumes also uh, decreasing with, uh, with stress. Uh, next, uh, which is still in the realm of, uh, despite the, the data here, is still in the realm of uh, research uh, and uh, fancy things we do, we look at dyssynchrony imaging. This is dyssynchrony at rest and dyssynchrony post-stress. The most important number to look at is here the standard deviation of the mean of the synchrony and anything below eight usually is is normal so you can see here all the segments of the heart are contracting all almost at the same time and relaxing at the same time both in, uh, in the rest uh, images uh, and the stress images and finally before we start reporting the study we look at myocardial blood flow this is one of the biggest advantage of doing pet myocardial perfusion images we look at the rest flow we look at the stress flow, basically what happens after a vasodilation, and then we look at the flow reserve. Uh, in general, we still right now at our center, we only report this, the flow reserve. We look at the rest and stress flow uh, for more uh, of a kind of a, um, uh, evaluation for artifacts, for uh, high rest flow, indicating anemia or shunting or something else, uh, just as a quality assurance. But the reserves are important. And we use a cutoff that's been published uh, very well in the literature, anywhere between 1.7 and 1.8 for normal. Anything above that, uh, we call it normal. So this is the mean flow reserve for all the segments and globally here is well within uh, normal. Next step is to look at the CT images. And here we can see that uh, the CT images, despite the poor quality of the CT images we do for these uh, studies, uh, very often, uh, we are able to see a uh, calcification as you can see here in the LAD system. That's something we report uh, uh, to indicate presence of coronary calcification, especially in patients with no previous coronary artery disease or no previous revascularization. And then we scroll up and down with this and look at lung nodules, extra cardiac findings that are worrisome or need to be addressed uh, during this uh, test. More importantly, and finally, we have to generate a clinically meaningful report. In our, uh, in our system, at our center, we use the uh, AUC, the appropriate use criteria for uh, uh, myocardial perfusion imaging as an indication for the test. So these are all listed right here. And we have some special ones that are not addressed by the AUCs. One of them is amyloid heart disease, anomalous coronary arteries, heart transplant, sarcoid, uh, known and unknown. So these are specialty, subspecialty uh, things we look at. So we capture them within our uh, system. Then we have uh, uh, all for quality assurance and for uh, posterity, what uh, doses we give, what time we give the dose, whether attenuation correction was used or not. Of course, with PET, we use that all the time. The injection time, what agent we use, and so on and so forth. These are all uh, populated uh, in our uh, database. Then the next page in our database is usually for reserved for the stress parameters of the, of the myocardial perfusion imaging. So here we have uh, uh, all ranging from height and weight of the patient uh, to risk factors, blood pressure, uh, EKG findings, uh, what happened during the stress test, did they have any symptoms, did they drop the blood pressure, what was their functional capacity, uh, things that have uh, important clinical implications as well as prognostic implication for the, uh, for the patient. The next page you will see is usually the page, the page related to the gated perfusion, uh, the gated uh, images. And here we can see we comment about the LV size and function, both globally and uh, segmentally. Uh, not infrequently, we see patients who have asymmetric uh, left ventricular hypertrophy that you can detect actually by myocardial perfusion imaging or apical uh, hypertrophy that you can see we comment on that. It populates also the volumes. Uh, volumes by PET are in general reasonable and uh, I would say very reproducible and very comparable to what we see by MRI. The next page will be a comment about the RV function. This is the ventricle that we should not ignore. In PET, we see it reasonably well, 
we should uh, comment about it. We should comment about the function of the right ventricle, the size of the right ventricle. Patients right now are presenting with multiple comorbidities besides CAD. So it's, this is an important parameter that should not be ignored, it should be reported. The next page is the page related to the perfusion, uh, which will show on top, usually we'll put the sum stress score, uh, sorry, we'll put the stress um, uh, image, the stress basically a score for the, for, the, for the study. The bottom uh, score here will reflect the rest score of the study. We'll fill in the myocardial flow ratios uh, right here, as I showed you earlier. And then we'll comment about the study, whether it's normal or abnormal. And if it's uh, non-diagnostic, why it is non-diagnostic. And then we move through this list here to comment about ischemia presence or absence. We comment about the ischemic bed. And we have a subcategory here where we can say it's mild, moderate, or severe ischemia in each bed. So we can go the same way with LAD, uh, CERC, uh, and RCA. And I will show you in future videos how to fill this when it's abnormal and how to populate it. Similarly, for SCAR or for hibernation, we make the same comments. And uh, finally, we talk about uh, uh, TID in these patients, what happened to the ventricle post-stress. If the patient happened to have an FTG study, we comment about it uh, right here in the bottom uh, plot. Uh, the last uh, step in any uh, test is to uh, uh, assign a risk for this study. So this is a normal study, of course, which would be a low risk. If the patient has extensive ischemia or extensive scarring or a very low ejection fraction, this test, uh, test would not be low risk, would be anywhere between intermediate and high risk. And we'll go through that in future videos, how to assign different risks for patients. And then, uh, based on the study, and then we comment about uh, the drop in ejection fraction if there is any. If, these, if we find anything urgent to report, we usually comment here uh, who was notified and what time and what date uh, the uh, uh, information was relayed to the referring physician. And uh, at the bottom of the screen here, you can see two uh, important uh, parameters. One is the incidental findings, whether it's related to coronary calcification, enlarged aorta, aortic reflex calcification, lung nodules, and we have a free text here for pleural effusions, uh, other masses that we can see. The other day we had a patient with a thymoma, we have to comment about it. And extremely important to compare to a prior uh, exam. Compare your study to a prior study. It saves you a lot of hassle. It uh, gives you an idea what's happened before and how it was read before. It acts almost as a quality assurance for your own self or for your lab, how to read these studies. And uh, it will save you also from a lot of phone calls. Did you look at the previous study? Did you, uh, did you compare it to the previous study? Referring physicians are usually interested in that. So with that, uh, this is basically how we read a normal study, how we read a normal PET study. Uh, it's gonna get more complicated as we put uh, more videos online for you uh, for other studies that are not normal. Uh, and we'll do that uh, in the future. Uh, finally, this is how the conclusion should look like. It has all the parameters you need to look at uh, normal study, no ischemia, no scar, normal EF, normal LV size, normal right ventricular size and function. This is a low risk scan. Patient has normal calcification and we compare the study to a prior study. So this is the important piece of information that the referring doctor is interested in. This has a lot of not only useful information, has all the prognostic information you need to know about the study uh, right in one uh, single uh, place. Uh, thank you so much and uh, see you with the next video.